Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com. And you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry. And we do small groups all over our community, from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, good morning. How are you? Y'all glad to be here? Hey, I can't say enough about what's going to happen in here tonight. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bump that number up to 3,000 instead of 2,500. Can I do that? Ministerially speaking, maybe. Um, we always guess how many numbers because it's hard to get a count. But uh, this is really a cool night tonight. And so if, you, if you've never been a part of that, come check it out. It's good. Uh, it's just, it's kind of a good crazy that goes on here tonight. So, hey, uh, y'all give Andrew and the band a hand. Amen. It, I know Jake said something last week about it. If you're watching on Facebook, uh, these guys are, we're kind of in this training mode right now and uh, raising up new leaders and bringing up new people. And, and so like I told you a couple of months ago, some weeks it'll be kind of goofy. And then the next week we'll kind of do rapture practice because it's so good. We'll be jumping, thinking Jesus is coming back and, and all that kind of good stuff. So I'm excited about what God's doing. Some of you will get that rapture practice in a minute. But anyway, um, uh, it's excited about what God's doing and I appreciate your patience and as we learn, as we uh, raise up new leaders and see what God's doing uh, in our worship ministry. We're in this series called Hello, My Name is God. We're looking at those redemptive names of God. And today, we want to look at the life of Abraham. And I know that it doesn't matter where you come from. You've probably heard about Abraham. If, if different world religions claim Abraham. And so uh, it's this great story that we're going to look at today. And uh, we got to get the whole picture. But, you know, I, I want to say this. I've been thinking about this all week long. I've been looking at this because we're going to run through Genesis 12 to Genesis 21 in about seven minutes, and that's a lot of Scripture to cover in about seven minutes. Uh, But I think sometimes we as Christians, when we look at Scripture, uh, John, we'll read something in there, and because you and I grew up in church, and you grew up, and I grew up, we'll read it and go, yeah, that's what happened. And people out there that are lost, and maybe you're in the room and you don't know a whole lot about Christianity or the Bible or anything like that, if you read that, you go, dude, that's really weird. In fact, that's crazy. And I think sometimes we as Christians, we don't acknowledge that. It doesn't mean it's not true. It doesn't mean it's not powerful. It's just sometimes we're so familiar with the story. We're like, yeah, he offered his wife as his sister. Like that's normal, right? I mean, maybe in Arkansas, but not here, right? (laughs) So, yeah, (laughs) Welcome. Uh, Anyway, um, so today I want to look at this story, and and there's some strange things, and if you're new to Christianity, or maybe you're visiting, maybe your girlfriend drug you up here today, or your wife, or or maybe it's the first time you've been in church in a long time, or you're watching for the first time, there's some weird stuff we're going to look at today, and I don't want to make light of that. It doesn't make it less true. doesn't make it less powerful, but it's just kind of some weird stuff. And so the story of Abraham starts in Genesis chapter 12, and that's where we find where God told Abram, at that time Abram, he hadn't changed his name yet to Abraham, uh, he he told Abram, I'm going to make you you the father of great nations. You're going to be the father of many nations. In other words, you're going to have a son and an offspring, and, and you're going to have this incredible legacy. The problem is Abraham didn't have a son. He and Sarah, his wife, they were already old, okay? I'm not going to go there, but they were already old, and so uh, there was, they were thinking, there's no way this is going to happen, and so what he told them to do is, I want you to leave your homeland. I want you to go down to Egypt, and when he gets down to Egypt, this is where the story kind of gets goofy, and 
and they get down to Egypt. Pharaoh sees Sarah and goes, woohoo, she is good looking. And so he comes to Abram and he goes, hey man, who's the girl with you? Kind of like seventh grade, you know, write a note. Will you go with me? Check yes or no. So Pharaoh sent Abram a note. Will you go with me? Yes or no. And, and, and so it goes over there and Abram's like scared to death because he didn't want to tell Pharaoh because he's a uh, foreigner in the land. So he tells Pharaoh, sure, it's my sister. How did you think Sarah felt, right? How would that go over in your marriage, right? Okay, I don't care how old you are. And see, Abraham feared the world more than he feared God. And by the way, I forgot to mention, Abraham, if you know anything about the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 11, there's that thing called the Hall of Faith. Some of you have been to the Hall of Fame up in Canton, Ohio, and you've been to all these different things. Well, Abraham, there's this, there's this story in Hebrews chapter 11 where the scripture has listed all the great men and women of faith. We find Abraham, the guy that just offered his wife to Pharaoh, check yes or no, will you go with me? And told Pharaoh, you can have her because she's my sister. That guy is in Hebrews chapter 11. So let's go on. In chapter 15, uh, you know, what a great guy we're talking about here. And some of you go, wait, this guy made the whole, exactly. In chapter 15, we find Abraham again, this great man of faith where God comes back and he tells him, look, Abraham, you're going to have, you're going to be a father of great nations. And so what basically Abraham's going, well, you know, I hear what you're saying and, and, and I'm kind of a little intrigued about it, but, but you got to prove this. You got to prove this. I mean, God, you promised me this, but how can it happen? You remember, I'm old, and, and Sarah is way past childbearing age. It ain't going to happen. And then in Genesis chapter 16, Abraham gets impatient, because we never do that, do we? This is the part that's not weird, but then it gets really weird, right? Because yeah, some of you are laughing because you know the story, and you're like, oh, yeah, how's he going to explain this? Well, it's easy, because see, they get impatient, and it was all Sarah's idea. It wasn't Abraham's idea. And so Sarah came to Abraham and said, look, you know, I'm kind of old. I'm dried up. It ain't going to happen. God told us it's going to happen. So look, the best way this is going to happen, because God hadn't fulfilled it, and it's not going to happen. Because remember, there, when God made the promise until we have Isaac, that's the actual son that Abraham and Sarah have, it's 13 years. It's, it's a long time. And so they get a little patient, and so they take things into their own hands and Abraham's uh, sitting there and Sarah comes out look here's Hagar she's really good looking and she's really young and so why don't you go sleep with her <laughs> yeah, exactly. nobody wants to laugh because you're in church you're like huh, really and Abraham goes well I mean if you say I should Yeah, see how weird that is? And so Abraham goes and sleeps with her, and sure enough, she gets pregnant, and they have a son named Ishmael. They do what God told them not to do, that God's going to promise. And to this day, Ishmael and Isaac are still their ancestors. If you look in the Middle East, they're still battling because they took things into their own hands. And in chapter 17, God's reminding this great man of faith again. And he says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to honor this. I'm going to do this. And you're going to enter into a covenant of circumcision. And you and your household and all the males and all the animals, you're going to be circumcised. In other words, we're going to cut away the old and we're going to bring in the new. And you're going to live now my way. You tried to do it your way. How'd that work out for you? And so now you're going to do it my way. So Abraham goes through all of this. And God then again tells him that he's going to have a son of a great nation and your name's going to be known forever. And you know what Abraham, this great man of faith who made the hall of faith did? He fell down on his face and cracked up. What a man of faith, right? And then Sarah comes along and she starts laughing. Now this is the man of faith. Now sometimes we run past this and we as Christians, we look at that and go, yep, they laughed at God. That's normal. It's weird. I mean, can we just acknowledge that? I know some of you have been in church so long, you can't, you can't see the weirdness of Scripture sometimes. But, I mean, yeah, that's kind of crazy. And so then he goes, and we find the next few couple of chapters, we go through Sodom and Gomorrah. You know that story where, where God's looking for just even a few righteous men, and God ends up destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. Then chapter 20, we find again that Abraham's trying to give his wife away again, fearing the world more than he feared God. Then in chapter 21, we see where God fulfills the promise where Isaac was born. And you know what the name Isaac means? Laughter. Laughter. I want you to name him Isaac because I want you to remember you laughed at me and my promise. I don't want you to ever forget that. But I think also Isaac brought them much joy and laughter in their journey. And then that brings us to chapter 22 today. 
and we find our next name of God. Because remember, we're revealing these names of God, not so that we're smarter, not so that we have knowledge, not so we can argue, not so that we have just all this information up here. Because when we learn the names of God and we learn the characteristics of God, all of a sudden we begin to live out of that. And we can begin to trust him more because some of us really love the creator God, remember Elohim, and some of us really love the Adonai. And we believe and we, we trust that, that he is a strong creator and we trust that God owns everything in the world. But hey, we're going to not include ourselves in that, everything but us. But many of us, this is where we struggle and this is why we're looking at the redemptive names of God. Because for many of us, and I've talked to people of, of, of my, my parents' generation, this whole idea of a personal God. That he is a Jehovah God, kind of dumbfounds us. And for some of us, we can't make that jump. And so part of the reason we're looking at these redemptive names of God is for us to understand that we not only have a strong creator God and a strong owner God, we also have a God that relates to us. And we see this incredible story with Abraham that God's relating to Abraham over and over and over again. And with each name, we see God revealing himself to someone, usually deeper character, greater revelation. But here's what I've learned as I begin to study these different names of God. And, and I've ordered books and I've, I've read online and I've read blogs and all that. So many times God reveals his name or his characteristics in the pain points of our life. It's in those pain points it's in those circumstances that none of us want and some of us are still mad about and some of us are still holding on to and yet it's in those moments when God reveals his characteristics. It's those pain points that it reveals that he's a source. So let's pick up the story in Genesis chapter 22, verses one and two. We're gonna read most of this chapter this morning together as we look at this. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. And he said, Abraham, here am I, Abraham replied, total surrender. I mean, by this time, I love that response. Here I am, I. here I am. Because up to this point, Abraham had done everything his way, right? And so we see a shift in this passage. Sometime later, God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham. And Abraham's only response is, here I am, I'm done. Total surrender at this moment. I love this. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, not Ishmael, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, which is about a three-day journey, and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. What's incredible about this passage is we read that as Christians and we go, yeah, that's normal. And yet when we look at that, there's so much tension there. And can you imagine to be tested in the worst way possible. And I know some of you, I know your journey. Some of you have been tested. Some of you have had incredible loss in your journey. But here we see this incredible test coming that he asked Abraham to give him the one thing Abraham loved most. And that was his son, his dream come true. And keep in mind, Abraham needed Isaac. Abraham needed Isaac because Abraham needed Isaac to fulfill the promise that God had told him that I'm going to do that Abraham had surrendered to. And so here's this incredible contradiction that the very thing God promised him, now God is telling him, I want you to give him back to me and I want you to do it. I mean, this is incredible because if Isaac dies, the nation dies. I mean, on the surface, it's almost as if God is now contradicting himself. That God said, you're going to be a great nation, but now I want you to kill the one that would make you a great nation. And if you read the entire passage, there's no indication that Abraham, when he heard this, Tim, can you imagine going to Becky and telling Becky what God just told you? There's no indication that Abraham ever went to Sarah and said, oh, by the way, Sarah, God's told me to kill Isaac. How do you think that would go over? And we read this passage and we miss that incredible tension. Of course he didn't because he was in a mess. He had a theological con contradiction because God, its instruction goes against the promise. And so he has this contradiction going on in his mind. You ever been in a mess of contradictions? Anybody in here? It's like when you get in that moment, you just can't quite figure it out. So he's got this theological contradiction because God's told him this is going to happen. But now you're asking this. He's got this emotional contradiction because he loves Isaac. 
And so now you're asking me to give up the thing I love the most. And he's facing a social contradiction because he's already known, everybody's already known to him going to be the father of a great nation. And he's now had this baby in this incredible moment of a miracle. And now there's a social contradiction because now he's going to lose that. And what are the people going to think about him? And then he's got this relational contradiction because if he goes up into the mountain and he kills Isaac and he comes home empty handed, he's got a real problem with Sarah. Can you see the contradictions? You ever been there? So we read that and we go, wow. See, here's what I've learned about this. You hadn't noticed trials are a part of life, aren't they? You live long enough. I believe that God will allow trials in our life to identify where we are spiritually, but also to prepare for us for where he wants us to go. We were talking about my good friend John Randalls last night and uh, we had 26 women up at a crucible event up in Oklahoma, and they're at a campground that John Randalls and I used to spend some time at and do some retreats at, and we were talking about Randalls last night, and Randalls used to always say this to us when he was alive and traveling. He would, he would say, guys, listen to me. You're either coming, you're either in a trial, you're either coming out of a trial, or you're getting ready to go into a trial. And everybody said? Amen. Or oh me. Right? Because trials are unavoidable. But here's the good news. When it comes to a trial, nothing comes to us or reaches us that hasn't passed through the hands of God. Because he is the Elohim, the creator God. He is the Adonai, the, the God who owns everything. And he's the relational God. So if he is a creator and the owner, then nothing comes to us that hadn't passed through his hand. That, that mess of contradictions that some of you have been in for 40 and 50 years. Because you're holding on to something that happened years ago that you're in the middle of that, understand that God wants to use that in our journey. You see, this means that God has a divine purpose for everything that happens in our life. Listen, if some of us can get that one statement I just said right there, it would change everything for you. That God has a divine purpose for everything that comes into our life. See, Abraham's trial was a test. He wanted to know where Abraham's heart was and his faith actually stood. And I'm sure Abraham had his doubt. I mean, chapter 12, he was intrigued. Oh, I'm going to have a son. Chapter 15, he was skeptical about the promise. Chapter 16, he was impatient. Chapter 17, he was incredulous. He laughed at God. Chapter 20, he still feared the world more than God. And now in verse 22, we found him at a place of surrender. But you could almost assume that, because we don't have all those thoughts that were going through his head, you can just almost assume that Abraham had this incredible contradiction going on in his head. Right in the middle of this. Abraham needed to be reminded, as we all do, as we said last week, that in our darkest moments, God does his best work. That in those darkest moments, God does his best work. He's often closest and nearest when he seems furthest away. In fact, I said this last week, I think it bears saying again that Jesus is more present than you and I are in this room right now. That Jesus is more present in the moment of your darkness than you and I are present in the moment. And I know that kind of poof blows our mind a little bit, but he's present. Unfortunately, many of us have missed the purpose of our trial or our test because we're so focused on the circumstance or the stress. And, and can I just be honest with you? I struggle too in the moment of stress and circumstance that I forget that God has a divine purpose. See, Abraham was in the middle of this tremendous test. In a mess of contradictions, he was faced with the choice between the blessing and the blesser. You ever been there? Between the blessing and the blesser. I love it that that Isaac was Abraham's blessing and, and God was testing Abraham to see which one he loved more. Because sometimes what God gives us, we fall in love with more than we do God. Sometimes we fall so in love with the blessing that it trumps the one who blesses us. And listen, God wanted to know if Abraham loved him only for him or for what his gifts were. My dad used to travel, and back in the 80s when I was growing up, dad would, would almost every month take the jet, and they would go to Chicago, and they would go to these tool shows, and, and, and his company would fly him all over the country looking at these different tools and that. And we would get so excited when dad would come home because back in those days, those tool shows, they gave away the coolest free gifts at those booths, if you remember that. They don't give away good gifts like that anymore. But dad would 
would always walk in the door and he had two sacks, one for John, one for me. That was my brother. And, and we would, could not wait for dad to come home and he'd land at Gregg County and he would drive up to Spring Hill where we lived and, and mom knew that he was on his way. And so my brother and I would stand at the door and we were so excited as little boys and, and he would walk in the door and we wouldn't, we wouldn't say, dad, we love you. Or dad, would you get us? Right? Right? And isn't it amazing? We understand that. And, and my dad loved us boys and he loved us so much. He would just give us those. But I just have to think now being a dad, there's sometimes you just want your kids to love you for who you are, not what you give them. Amen. And when you get that unsolicited little boy crawls up in your bed, like mine does every once in a while, I still relish those moments because I know they won't last forever. And he crawls up in bed with me and he snuggles up beside me and he He's not going to see this, so I'll say this. Um, and he kisses me, unsolicited, and says, Dad, I love you. Those are the moments you relish as a daddy. And you see, here we have Abraham at that moment. That God loves him. And can I just say this to you? God loves you. And because he loves you, just like my daddy loved me, he gave me good gifts. That my heavenly father, because he loves you, he wants to give you good gifts, but he wants us to love him apart from his gifts. He doesn't want to be just a genie in a bottle. He doesn't want us just to rub that bottle and say, you perform, daddy. You jump, daddy. He wants to be our father because he loves you. He does. And so here Abraham's in the test of his life. Look at verses 3 and 4. Early the next morning, Abraham, everybody say, got up. He got up, and everybody say, Loaded loaded his donkey and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering he set out for the place God had told him about and on the third day Abraham looked up and he saw the place in the distance and he said to his servants stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there we will worship and then we will come back to you now I want you to notice those words that are highlighted on the on the screen this morning there says he got up it says he loaded up it said he took up. It says he cut or split. It says he set out and arose. I want you to notice every one of those words were not words of hesitation. When God told him what he wanted him to do, there is an immediate response. And that immediate response was not Abraham going, now God, why do you want me to do that? Hang on, God. Um, you, you know, if, if, if I sacrifice Isaac, the, the, the covenant's dead. And, and notice that he didn't even go to Facebook and say, hey, I'm asking for a friend, right? Can you give me some responses? Because I think God's telling me to do this, but what do you all think? Just for a friend, it's not me. Because if you put on Facebook, God told you to kill your son, they're probably going to come get you, right? Notice that Abraham got up, got going, got doing what God asked him to do. I think it refers back to that statement in verse 1. Here am I. I'm done. So God, whatever. Whatever. See, I think all of us need to get to that point in our journey. Here am I. A response of surrender. And I want you to look at verse 5 because verse 1 refers to verse 5 when, when he says to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We, notice the word, we will worship and then we will come back. The request to sacrifice to Isaac seemed ridiculous. It goes against everything from a human perspective, yet in the midst of his confusion, I want you to notice what Abraham did. He trusted and he worshiped. He trusted and he went to church. He trusted and he traveled three days to go to church. That's a long way to go to church. Some people won't drive 13 miles. Abraham walked three days. Why? To worship. So powerful. Even though Abraham knew what God asked him to do, he believed in that moment, in that trusting statement that if God indeed wanted him to kill him, then God could indeed resurrect him from the dead. And you know what? He had never seen a resurrection from the dead. 
Now, he had seen a pretty stinking supernatural moment that an old woman that was 100 years old that was dried up, dry as toast, I think he said, all of a sudden had a baby. Now, that's pretty dang supernatural, is it not? So here's Abraham going, here I am. Is that what you want me to do? You've already proven you can do anything you want to. You're the creator, God. You own it all. So God, you're relating to me. I'm going to do what you asked me to do because if I do that, I believe you can raise him. Woo, come on. Different problem, same God. Now look at this, 6 through 12, six more verses. It says, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering. Before I read this, can, can you imagine being there? If you were a bird sitting on a limb watching this, just think about this for a moment. Don't just let me read this. Don't just read this with me. Kind of get into the moment here because it's such a powerful moment. I would have loved, uh, and maybe one of these days God will replay it, uh, you know, on an MP4 or whatever heaven has, and we'll get to see all this and see the, the heavy breathing and all that's going on. It says, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and, and placed it on his son Isaac. Think Jesus, the cross. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, the fire and the wood are here. Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb, son, for the burnt offering. And the two of them went on together. Can you imagine the silence? When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there, and he arranged the wood on it. Don't miss the tension of this next statement. He bound his son, Isaac, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. Are you with me? You with me in the tension of this passage? But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, not once, twice. We don't know if he was shouting. We don't know if it was the angel of the Lord was raising his voice. But Abraham said, here I am again, that statement of surrender. I'm here. Do not lay a hand on that boy. Do not do anything to him. And now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only true son. Man, can you imagine the moment? But here's the statement that gets me. Look at verse 12. Now I know, I'm talking about the angel of the Lord, talking about the one who is with the Lord, talking about the one who comes from the Lord. Now I know that you fear God. Did God not already know that? All of a sudden, another contradiction, huh? I mean, isn't he omni, omnipresent, omniscient? I mean, we learned that from week one, right? That he's, he's everywhere and, and, and in here and out there and, and he's all around. He, he can be anywhere he wants to. He's all that. Doesn't he know the end from the beginning? Can you bring up anything to God and he not know the details? Can we bring up any problem of God and God couldn't solve it? And all of a sudden now there's this apparent contradiction. Didn't God already know before the knife was raised three days ago when he told him to go that that Abraham feared God? See, I think we learned something about the character of God. And there's a whole camp out there. Let me me, me just say this. Some of you... You're internet trolls, okay? And I love that because you, you study and you listen and you, you do all that. But there's a camp out there that believe, and they're a good camp. They're a conservative camp. But they literally believe that God is not a relator God. God said it in his word. He's not speaking ever again. Just stay in his word. Well, on the surface, that sounds spiritual, does it not? But here's what we learn about God in this story is that we also serve a God of emotions. Let me me explain this. God enters our emotions, and that's good news. Psalms 22, verse 3 indicates that God enthrones himself on our praise. You know that God could just sit back and go, I know what praise is. I invented it. 
I, I know who's going to praise me. I know who's praising me now. I know who's asleep right now. I know who's checked out and wondering if the Cowboys are playing today. I know who's praised me in the past. I know who really means it. I know everything there is about praise. I don't need to know anything about praise because I already invented it. And see, there's one camp out there that says that's, that's the God they serve. They don't need God to speak. They don't need God to do anything else. God's already done everything. And he's sitting up there going, you kids just need to get it. No, God says he enthrones himself on the praises of his people. In other words, God wants to enter in and experience it. There's something about praising God that brings him pleasure. There's something about that that he purposely and willingly steps in to our experience. I mean, why did God become man? Because not only to redeem us and not only because he's the creator God and the owner God, but he's a relator God that he wanted to come and experience us in all humanness, in the human experience that he's now able to sympathize us, with sympathize with us because Jesus became a man. He's not just some God out there. He's a God that's right here that understands pain and, and emotion and trauma and joy and, and, and all the things that we experience. So when the angel of the Lord says, don't lay a hand on that boy in verse 12, he said, don't do anything to him. Now I know you fear God. It isn't because he lacked the knowledge or the intellectual information. He now had experienced the event that he participated in the emotion and the experience. See, some of you, that tragedy that happened years ago, you don't think God was anywhere near and yet God was right in the middle experiencing that with you. He was right in the middle of that and we missed it. And he enters our moments of pain, our pain points, to experience them with us. That when we sing, when we speak, when we think that he is there, he is more present right now than you are. <laughs> Verses 13 and 14, and Abram, Abraham, this, this is where many of us miss. Because Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. And he went over and he took the ram, and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Mm. So Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, on that mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. I want you to notice a couple of things. Abraham didn't hear that ram trying to get out until he finished obeying he didn't hear it until he finished obeying. In fact, while Abraham and Isaac were coming up one side of the mountain, what they didn't know is God's interaction was coming up the other side. But they couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. See, many of us, we haven't made, we hadn't finished the journey. Many of us hadn't finished the journey because we're coming up one side of the mountain and God's solution is coming up the other side. But until you're obedient to finish what God told you, you're not going to find the solution because at that perfect moment, Galatians 4, 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent Jesus, born of a woman, born under the law. We said last week, well, guess what? God's timing is always perfect, but we've got to complete the obedience as children of God as we're walking in God, in those circumstances, in those pain points to finish what God's wanting to do. It's because at that perfect moment, God's going to take our uh, contradiction and he's going to bring his solution with the contradiction to give us the peace and the substitute that he wants to give us. I'm telling you, this changes everything. The two shall meet. And we see where God's name is revealed today. The Lord will provide. Now, this is an interesting name because it's Jehovah Jireh. And we learn this characteristic and we put the faith in it. It's going to change our lives that we know that God's already, because two words, that word jari means to see. It's the root word to see. And Abraham named the place where God provided a ram instead of Isaac, the Lord will provide because, because it could be translated also provide. So you got these two words to see and to provide. So how do we put those two together? What's the relationship? This is interesting because here's what it means that another word that relates to provide Provide and brings the two meanings together is provision. In other words, vision means to see. Provision means to see beforehand. 
So our God, who's a provider, listen to me, this is going to be big for some of you. The God, our provider, no matter what you're in, what circumstance you're in, what contradictions you're in, what happened to you 35 years ago, what happened to you 50 years ago, what happened to you 35 minutes ago when somebody offended you in this room, is that God's already seen beforehand and he's already provided. The question is, will you be obedient? Come on. I know some of us don't like this. You see, God's providence, his provision is something that will change our relationship with him because the Lord will provide as a relator God. It's not just a God going, hope you make it. Hey, you on your own now. See, there's some camps out there that believe God lost control. And so now he's sitting back there going, boys, this looks rough. Hope they can figure this one out. No, he's a God who sees beforehand and provides for those of us who will walk in that obedience of a relationship. I was reading this last week, and I love this definition of the providence of the provider of God. It's found in the Heidelberg Catechism. I want you to look at it because I just love what it says. It says, the Almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were by his hand, he still upholds the heaven and the earth with all creatures and so governs them, the herbs and the grass, the rain and drought, the fruitful and the barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poor. Yay, all thanks. Isn't that good? Yeah, come on. Yay, all thanks. Come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. I love that definition of provision. All things come from his hand. It's an incredible statement. It's not easy to believe at times. That's why we're talking about it. That's why we come back to it. You see, I want you to believe it because it's so dang biblical. Yay! All things come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. And see, when we embrace that, every circumstance, every moment changes when we realize it comes from him. So what must God see in us that he might provide for us when we're caught in a contradiction? I think he needs to see the same things he saw in Abraham. Get up, load up, take up, cut some wood, and then get out and go worship. What if that's how you responded to every contradiction? That you just got up, you took up, you loaded up, and you set out. And you worship. You know what all those words mean? Obedience. Obedience. You see, Abraham didn't delay. He did what God asked him. We've heard these statements before. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. And I like those statements about as much as you do. Can I just be honest? Because they're brutal. Think about Abraham's journey. Had he only gone part of the way, had he not finished the journey, he would have never experienced the providential God. He would have never experienced the solution on the other side. If he gave up and said, well, you know, Isaac, son, let's, let's go home. And he could have gone home and he probably would have lost his son in another way. But he had a missed on learning that God loves him. and He's provided for you. There's so much here because the truth is all of us have our Isaacs. There's not a one of us in this room. It's that thing you're holding on to so tightly. It's it's that thing that you least want to release. It's that relationship you don't want to go back to because it's going to mean you have to forgive them. It's that, it's that, event, that circumstance that happened in you that you, you've yet to forgive yourself, let alone God. And it's become an Isaac in your journey. You see, once God saw that he mattered more to Abraham than Isaac did, God intervened and he provided for Abraham so they could keep Isaac. You see, loving God means acting on what God says. It's not just singing songs, praying prayers, hearing sermons. I believe. I'm not asking if you believe this morning. I'm asking, do you know the Lord who provides? Do you know him? Have you surrendered to him? Because he loves you. You see, I know, I think we as Christians sometimes simplify this and go, well, it just, it's so easy. Listen, there, there, there's times where I don't understand. 
There's seasons where I don't, I don't want to love them. You ever been there? You, you ever been there? I, I don't want to forgive them. I don't, I don't want to serve them. In fact, I'd, I'd rather go home and sit in my garage and burn a cigar and hopefully nobody comes by, amen? That's how self-centered I can get. Anybody else with me? Anybody else want to make a confession? Yeah, all of you didn't. Because we all have our Isaacs, don't we? Some of us are holding tightly to your careers, your family, your marriage, your health, your finances, your search for a mate, and you're stuck. You're not moving forward. You're mad at God. You're holding so tightly to that tragedy or that, that, that circumstance. God has a solution waiting for you. But you're going to finish the journey. And that means for some of you, the journey you need to finish is you've been in church all your life, but you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Just honest. You believe, but it's not personal. And for some of you guys, you need, I, 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 when I talk to people all the time, I, I like Jesus and I like God, but that whole personal thing is just way out there. Listen, that's why we looked at Jehovah God, because he's a relator God. He's not just some out there God. He's a right now God. And some of us are holding on to these Isaacs in our journey. And the question is whether or not we'll surrender to him as the prov provider God. You see, whatever you're holding on to, you've got to let go in order to experience the God who provides. To do what God instructs you to do. It may be forgiveness. It may be surrender. Even if it doesn't make sense. Simply because he has your best interest at heart. See, some of you right now, your heart is pounding out of your chest because you know in just a minute I'm going to pray and there's going to be people up here and you know because there's something and it doesn't make sense because your heart's never pounded like this. You've never had this moment like this and you know that the moment I say amen, you need to come give your life to Jesus and right now it doesn't make sense because you're, you're old, man, and, and you're wise and you've had this figured out but there's something in you happening right now that God's calling you because he loves you, and he wants to enter in to your experience. Would you surrender today? Come on. Maybe you got some Isaacs you need to lay down. I go back, and I look how, Jesus, how it finished in Genesis 22, 15 to 18. It says, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the skies, the sand of the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. And though your offspring, through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. See, Isaac was just the beginning of an incredible mammoth blessing. And Abraham could have decided to keep Isaac, but he finished. See, I believe God longs to be our provider, but he's wanting us to be willing to obey, to seek him, and to place nothing above him. And for some of you, you've got it all figured out, man. But there's something in you right now. There's a contradiction in you right now. Amen. And the only way to solve that contradiction is just going, here am I. I'm yours. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for your word. I pray as we respond, Lord, as we take communion, as uh, our prayer warriors um, are across this front. Lord, if there's somebody here today that God, very honestly, they need a relationship with you. God, would you let the scales fall off their eyes? That God, that pounding of their heart right now, that it doesn't make sense because they already had you relegated to a God that was out there, not a God that is in here. And now all of a sudden, you're right here. God, would you give them courage to maybe step out and grab one of these prayer warriors by the hand? Lord, as us the rest of us and many in this room wrestle. God, would you help us trust you as our provider, the one who sees beforehand and has provided. That God, now nothing that comes at us will ever, ever, ever surprise you because you're the God who sees and has provided beforehand. Thank you for loving us. And God, as we respond through communion, as we respond this morning, 
God, give us courage. I love you. And we ask it in that beautiful name, Jesus, and everybody said, amen. Let's stand. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.